speaker is Raid Musulin. He will give um, a holistic view of climate risk. Raid Musulin is a principal at Finity Consulting in Sydney, Australia, focusing on extreme events and climate risk. Previously, Raid Musulin served as the Chief Executive Officer of FB Alliance Insurance, Chief Operating Officer of Aon Benfield Analytics Asia Pacific, and Vice President Operations, Public Affairs and Reinsurance for the Florida Farm Bureau Insurance Companies. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together virtually for Raid Musselin. Thank you very much, Andreas. Can you hear me? I can, and okay, I trust good. so thank can you. everybody else. Thank you. Well, I will share my screen. And uh, again, thank you very much for um, letting me join you today. Um, today, I want to kick off the conference with a bit of a holistic look at, um, at climate risk from several dimensions. And I, I want to start by talking about the many faces of climate risk. There's obviously massive fires occurring in Canada right now, and we're very familiar with the problems of wildfires and then the smog they are creating on huge cities in North America. We saw uh, in, in recent times, Pakistan suffered massive floods, which led to refugee problems and a really wipeout of their agricultural system. But we also face climate risk from decarbonization as the products we insure or the loans we underwrite have to shift to an electrified uh, infrastructure. We have political risk with uh, changes in policy possible at every election in democratic countries. We have issues with pests like Zika virus and other things that are moving into new areas from, from where they're now able to thrive due to climate change. We have food crises and crop failures in Africa. We have new reporting requirements from the ISSB. And something relevant to Singapore, we have an increased uh, attention being paid to marine cargo and the amount of uh, carbon that's being released in transporting goods around in complex supply chains. So I went to COP27 as a representative of the International Actuarial Association. And this one booth uh, I took a picture of, it was Pakistan's um, uh, uh, exhibit and pavilion. And it's very important, you know, what goes on in Pakistan won't stay in Pakistan. And it makes the point that uh, carbon does not respect political borders and the problems in one country are rapidly going to become the problems in all countries as we move forward. So today I'm gonna to briefly touch on five things in the next uh, 25, 30 minutes. Uh, physical risk adaptation, transition risk, a few other climate considerations, and then per the theme of the conference, how do we become prepared to weather the storm? So uh, you, you have to start with the science, and I, I know most everybody here is quite familiar with this, but I, I wanna just take two or three minutes and just review the key messages from the recent AR6 report by the IPCC, because it couldn't be clearer. And if you need a digest of this, I highly recommend the IAA's paper, Climate Science, a Summary for Actuaries, which I was privileged to be a lead author on with the IPCC. The first message is the changes we have experienced in the climate in the last 100 or 200 years are completely unprecedented. We have massive increases in sea level rise, rates of sea level rise. We have ocean acidification, which affects the food chain and the ability of the oceans to feed us, which is the highest in 2 million years. Unprecedented oceanic heat content, which fuels uh, typhoons and tropical cyclones vanishing Arctic sea ice levels and glacier melt that feeds sea level rise. It's also crystal clear that humans are responsible for this. There is no scientific debate. This chart from the IPCC report shows in green at the bottom what would have occurred if humans had not released greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And you can clearly see around the time the humans started 
you know, releasing massive amounts of uh, carbon and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, the warming shot up far above the long-term trend line. So that, again, there is no question that this is correlated with human activity. And it's clear too that this is having significant impacts on things very important to human civilization, including uh, sea level rises, hot air conditions, which are leading to heat stress in many places, reduced uh, glaciation, which is uh, not only causing sea level rise, but causing problems with uh, water in rivers and, and catchments that feeds agriculture. Uh, it changes in the growing season and many other effects, uh, which are not yet completely well understood. Very importantly, when you look at the scenarios that the IPCC has put out for future warming, uh, you, you, you see that no matter what we do in terms of decarbonization, if we virtually stopped emitting carbon and other greenhouse gases today, the results through 2040 would be virtually the same as we as though we considered continued on our current pattern. And, and this is a very sobering thought because it basically means that in the next 20 or 30 years, many countries like Singapore, Australia, Europe, and others that are pushing to decarbonize will not only incur the cost of decarbonization, but will also incur the costs of the climate effects that we can see happening as a result of the warming world. And the wor working groups from the IPCC have uh, put out five uh, SSPs, uh, Shared Socioeconomic Pathways, that describe future states, uh, ranging from low carbon uh, emissions one, which is like SSP 1.9, to high emissions one, which is 5 to 8.5. And you can see in the red circle that, that it is going to be uh, very little change through 2040, and it's only in the 2050 to 2070, 2080 timeframes that we see significant divergence of the effect on warming. The actuaries climate indices, which the North Americans and Australians put out, show clear effects on extreme weather. These are extracts from the latest uh, ACI and AACIs, and what they basically show is the trend in extreme weather represented by the 90th or 95th percentile of extreme weather readings, things like sea level rise, sea levels, um, temperatures, wind, rainfall, etc. And it's clear both in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere that we're seeing an increasing level of uh, extreme weather, and that leads to an increasing level of insurance losses. We're also seeing more compound extreme events. So this is a, it's just simply an example of what I mean by compound events. Uh, about uh, a year and a half, two years ago, we saw a massive outbreak of tornadoes in the state of Kentucky in the US that caused unprecedented levels of property damage. It was one of the most severe events in December in history in the United States, and it was a result of abnormally high temperatures, unusual jet stream patterns, but it's thoroughly consistent with what scientists have been expecting in a warming world. Now, at that same time, lumber prices, which are needed to rebuild all those buildings and structures, were at a, a massive uh, premium over historical averages. In fact, they were running five times what they had in historical averages, and that was partially, or if not significantly affected by beetle infestations in Canadian lumber producing areas that uh, infested the trees and reduced the yield of forests that are needed to produce the lumber that we use to rebuild homes. Now, if you're an actuary pricing insurance or looking at reinsurance in places like this, you need to think about not only uh, what's happening with the weather, but how is climate change affecting the rebuilding costs? How is it affecting the ability uh, of catastrophe models to measure the exposure to extreme loss? And I'd suggest to you in this case, this is not a demand surge problem or post-loss amplification, which is normally accounted for in CAT models, but it's a completely different phenomena, which is a compound extreme event. And there's a lot of examples of this around the world right now 
And we need to be very vigilant about the possibility that multiple severe events can occur in short periods of time. And one event, say wildfires, which burn off the vegetation, can then have an effect on things like flooding in, in, in the next month or two, as there's no longer sufficient vegetation to absorb the rainfall. And that increases runoff, which then increases the flood potential because you've had an extreme fire. So now I wanna to turn to adaptation because if we are going to face significant weather effects in the next two to three decades, we need to adapt. It's important to understand that in the language of the IPCC, they distinguish between mitigation, which in their world means reducing emissions and reducing the drivers of climate change, versus adaptation, which is measures to adapt to climate change through things like disaster management, infrastructure upgrades, et cetera. And the IPCC points out that some, uh, and, and, and the, the, the literature points out, that some things affect both mitigation and adaptation, which is things like water conservation, education, and reforestation. So it, it's important again to kind of get this lexicon correct because often insurance people talk about mitigation, meaning reducing losses, but in fact that refers to reducing emissions in the, uh, in the lexicon of the climate scientists. Um, one other point is that mitigation and adaptation occur over different time horizons. You know, mitigation takes decades or centuries to uh, have an effect on temperatures and weather, whereas in adaptation, you can take actions to adapt that can have an effect in a year. And if we think about adaptation, we can think about several different approaches to the problem. So we can reduce the hazards. Uh, when I was at COP27, there was discussion of replanting mangrove uh, trees in coastal areas to improve their ability to withstand high tides. Uh, there is ways that we could say, um, you know, increase reservoirs to try to, you know, mod modulate the water flow in rivers. We could also try to reduce vulnerability by things like hazard proofing housing, better building codes, better land use. Uh, practices. And we can also reduce exposure by moving people out of harm's way, by uh, evacuating people. But this is often highly controversial because it's very disruptive to communities and others. But there's limits to adaptation, and there's limits to how much we can protect ourselves from changing climate. There's quite a good bit of evidence in countries, for example, Australia, where I live, that the insurance industry has been innovating and trying to be a leader in this in many areas. I know many global reinsurers have been at the forefront of efforts to try to uh, you know, ring the alarm for decarbonization. The UK uh, insurance industry has been very active in this, has, has been several Asian insurers. And for example, in, in Australia, we've observed insurers doing things like um, looking at shadow carbon pricing, um, you know, helping to support electric vehicle infrastructure, uh, underwriting clean energy technology. And insurers are lobbying governments to invest in adaptation. The, middle, the first graphic here is, is uh, some reports from the Insurance Council of Australia, where they're talking about how we can create a more resilient country through investments and, and high cost benefit investments in protecting our communities against um, extreme weather and, and extreme, um, extreme sea level rise. And we also have some um, insurers who are using innovative techniques to say build back better by building, uh, when they have to rebuild a property to try to build it in a more resilient manner to say replace um, one type of roofing with another that's more resistant to fire or helping to elevate, uh, like you say, uh, electric sockets higher in, in, a, in a room so that they do not uh, flood, you know, become uh, waterlogged in a flood. So there's quite a bit going on in the insurance industry, and this is really important for us as actuaries to be across. So now I'd like to turn to transition risk and opportunity, because this is another major challenge that actuaries need to get across. It's almost breathtaking how quickly the world has responded uh, to the threat of climate change. And while it often looks like there's not a lot going on, in fact, there's been some 
extremely uh, transformative work done in many countries and by many supranational organizations. It's hard to believe that, that really only about seven and a half, eight years ago, we had the Paris Accords, where we basically established the TCFD, which uh, basically is going to govern uh, climate risk disclosures by firms all across uh, our economies. At COP26 in Glasgow, the ISSB, the International Sustainability Standards Board, was established and made a commitment to provide markets with high quality disclosures. And they're moving at a warp speed pace. For any of you who've had IFRS 17 or other um, you know, interactions with the Accounting Standards Board, you know, sometimes these things can take years or decades to come to fruition. The ISSB is moving so quickly. In COP27, which was simply a year later, they had uh, rolled out standards. They'd announced a partnership with a carbon disclosure project. They've uh, committed to issuing final standards probably by next week, which will then have to be adopted by national accounting associations across the world. Um, I was, again, privileged to be at COP27, and uh, Stuart and I there on the left uh, were able to meet with the uh, representatives of the ISSB on behalf of the actuarial profession and establish a good relationship with them. In fact, they were staying at the same hotel we were, so we had quite a bit of opportunity to interact with them. And, and that really showed me the quality of the people. The gentleman in the middle is uh, Jin Dong, and next to him is Marty, who is their uh, director. And uh, they're extremely high quality people and doing just some amazing work in this space, which I found really impressive. Uh, now, the bad news of that is that they're moving at a quick pace, which is probably going to affect actuaries a lot faster than uh, we, we might have uh, believed in the past. So when we think about transition risk, you know, we have to understand that when uh, we reduce emissions substantially, and in, in most countries in, in uh, the G20 are committed to significant reductions, that financial institutions who actuaries work for are going to face rapid changes in who their customers are, what risks need to be financed or insured. We're going to have to price those things without a lot of good historical information, and we're going to need to develop a capability to deal with rapidly changing technology, massively changing market expectations, et cetera, which is going to occur at a pace that we're frankly not well accustomed to. And we're going to see changes in technology, which is going to drive you know, renewables, changes in the transport system, uh, changes in how all the components of buildings are made, agriculture. We're going to have policies emerge from governments to talk about net zero pro, uh, targets. There's going to be pressure to adopt carbon pricing and measurement of things like scope three emissions. We're going to have changes in building standards and building codes and land use policies. Markets are going to be affected. You're going to see a reduction in things, for example, like uh, fossil fuel uh, activity. You're going to see more carbon trading. We're going to see significant increases in demand for minerals like copper, lithium, and rare earths. And firms are also going to face significant reputation risk, which is going to arise from consumer preferences where they want to do business with firms which exhibit high ESG credentials. There's going to be questions about companies' social license to exist if they continue to uh, underwrite and fund fossil fuel activities. There's going to be a focus on corporate responsibility. There's going to be a big focus on greenwashing. Actuaries who work for firms that, say, provide D&O insurance for boards are going to have to be cognizant of the risk of lawsuits for greenwashing. Actuaries are going to have to price electric vehicles. We're going to have to get involved in, in things like um, agriculture, agriculture insurance in countries where there's agricultural insurance. And it's going to open up all kinds of new uh, opportunities for actuaries and things like pricing and measuring carbon and, and working in energy markets. So it's actually a very exciting time. But we're going to see some very significant economic dislocations in the next decade or two. 
We're going to see industries, regions, and even whole countries lose jobs while others are going to grow. And many countries, and Singapore's not really on this list, but many countries do not have social safety nets to manage this type of situation. And that's going to create significant issues on migration and pressures for countries. As Pakistan said, what goes on in Pakistan doesn't stay in Pakistan. And that's going to have implications for financial institutions, including changes in markets, declines in asset values. Banks may face loan defaults of, um, of, uh, of, of uh, say, loans that are underwritten in coal country where people can't service their loans. You're going to see stranded assets. We generally often observe workers' comp compensation claim rates be affected when industries close and plants retrench workers. But that's also going to lead to new growth opportunities in solar energy, renewables, mining. We're, but we're going to need different products, and actuaries are going to be involved in creating those products. And we're also going to have a discontinuity where it's going to be very difficult to use past experience to price future risk. But with economic transformation comes both risk and opportunity. I want to just give you one example of where this is going to affect all of us. And if you think about the amount of minerals that are going to be required to electrify the vehicle fleets all around the world and to electrify transport and to electrify heating and, and other things, you can see here on the left that an electric car uses considerably more minerals than a conventional car. And a lot of the um, renewable uh, energy technologies like wind and solar also use significantly more uh, minerals than the old ways of doing things with coal and gas. And that is gonna lead to a significant growth in mineral demand over the next 20, 30, or 40 years. These charts show changes in demand for various um, minerals from, from various uh, SSPs, either a, a current, do, you know, sort of current trajectory in the second bar to a very aggressive net zero in the far right bar. And that's going to lead to significant increases in the demand for, for minerals and things of that nature. And that's going to create some great opportunities for countries. Just as an example in Australia, um, you know, 2% of Australia's landmass uh, could be used uh, to produce a huge amount of renewable electricity. And there's currently a, a plan in place to um, consider building a cable to Singapore to produce electricity in Australia and export it to, to Singapore and parts of Asia. And Australia has massive opportunities to do things like this. Australia, again, has significant uh, reserves of all of these um, types of uh, minerals, uh, lithium, cobalt, et cetera, as do other countries in the region. Indonesia has got significant nickel reserves, et cetera. So there's going to be quite a bit of activity in many countries to support the economy of the future. I want to now just touch on a few other climate related considerations and then close with some comments on actuaries and how we will weather the storm. And greenwashing is a significant issue. And again, I'm just using an Australian example because I'm familiar with it, but I'm sure the MAS and others in, in other parts of, of Asia and Singapore are doing the same thing. But with the growing amount of investment products and ESG out there, there's a significant uh, opportunity or perhaps temptation to misrepresent the extent to which a product or service is environmentally friendly, sustainable, or ethical, as we heard in the first session. There's, there's quite a bit of interest in ESG, ESG investing. And the regulators, for example, in Australia and other countries are on the lookout. And this quote here from ASIC says, we're looking for funds and products that are making misleading claims and cracking down on them. And they're putting out guidance, which we need to be aware of, again, of those of us advising these firms on risk. And the ACCC, which is like the consumer regulator in Australia, is doing internet sweeps to look for claims that are being made by firms all over Australia and to see whether those, those representations are correct, accurate, and credible. 
And when they're not, there's going to be some significant penalties, not only legal exposure, but for potentially civil penalties from regulators, et cetera. We're also, I mentioned earlier, the ISSB, and we're going to see significantly increased reporting requirements as countries adopt the ISSB standards. The ISSB has objectives to develop uh, globally a global baseline of standards to meet the information needs of investors, to be able to have companies report things in, in a basically a consistent manner across com companies and jurisdictions. And as I said before, they, they issued their first um, drafts last year, and they're already moving to finalize S1 and S2, which is one on sustainability, S1 and S2 is climate risk. And they're going to roll out in the next few years, uh, S3 on nature-based um, nature based issues like biodiversity uh, so, and some other things uh, coming after that. So there's quite a blizzard of reporting requirements about to come out. From, from the ISSB that it's gonna affect companies all over our region. Not only does the ISSB um, promulgate standards in their main standards S1 and S2, but on the right, I've also put up some examples of their exposure drafts by industry. So they actually have specific proposed standards for various industries. The two I show here are insurance and commercial banking, but they also have uh, standards specific to asset managers, et cetera. And, the, um, and, and, the, and basically a lot of these standards will have a significant effect on insurers. For example, the uh, S2 draft talks about how catastrophe modeling disclosures may need to be made about whether catastrophe modeling done for a general insurer uh, reflects climate risk and how so. Uh, another risk, aside from the regulatory thing that I think we should be paying attention to, is political risk. Um, you, you know, I, I've jokingly said in many cases that one of the biggest climates, climate risks we face is the next election, because we can have reversal of policies that can create significant problems for companies trying to make long-term plans. And, and I would suggest that creating sustainable po policy making is just an important part of this problem is creating a sustainable environment and a sustainable uh, biodiversity and sustainable practices. It's kind of interesting what President Biden did in his Inflation Reduction Act, uh, that they placed um, many of the benefits from the renewable energy in the opposition's district, which are represented by the red circles here. And it's quite interesting that in the initial uh, debt ceiling negotiations in the United States, the Republicans vowed to repeal all of the green energy initiatives. And in the final deal, none of them were repealed. And I think some of them took a look at this map and realized that their own electoral districts were going to be affected by um, you know, reducing uh, Biden's energy initiatives. And that's kind of interesting that you know, they're trying to design ways to survive elections. So just a few other issues before I close and take a question. Um, you know, reaching net zero in countries is necessary, but not sufficient. When I went to COP27, I spent a few days in Cairo after the meeting in Egypt. And I realized that Cairo has about as many people as Australia. And I saw a lot of people in Cairo driving around uh, cars from when I was in the un university in the 1970s. And it made me realize that, you know, if we get rid of all of our internal combustion engine vehicles in Singapore, Australia, Japan, Korea, and Europe, they're just going to go to places like Jakarta and Karachi and Egypt and Africa and South America and a lot of other places and continue to spew pollution for decades. And so we need to basically realize that to solve this problem, it takes more than just countries like Singapore to solve it. And also the investments and adaptations are huge and thoroughly unfunded. Um, there's gonna have to be significant efforts to protect countries like Bangladesh from uh, water intrusion, to protect the agricultural uh, infrastructure of India, to protect against heat stress in countries. Very few of those investments are being funded. Trade issues are going to be really significant. 
You're going to see protectionism issues, or perhaps it could be, you know, talked about onshoring. You're going to see differences in costs due to different emissions regimes. And you're going to see significant focus on the cost of transport and the complex supply chains. Right now, uh, countries have gained a competitive advantage through lower labor costs or other ease of doing business. But if you have to account for all the oil and the ships moving these, um, these goods around in complex supply chains, maybe the you know, economic advantage of low labor costs in a country does not outweigh the cost of moving goods and, around the world in order to produce uh, something like an iPhone. And finally, reporting and disclosure are going to be major activities for firms, particularly around scope three emissions. So how do actuaries prepare to weather the storm? Well, I'd say the first thing we ought to do is learn the language. Um, if you only had 15 minutes to invest in becoming a better uh, and more aware climate actuary, I'd say read a glossary. Um, you, you need, there's a completely different lexicon of terms, a blizzard of abbreviations, and a lot of uh, terminology without which you can't really function very well in, in this space. I'd also say upskill and systems thinking and scenario analysis. You know that we were often taught as actuaries that we could solve a discrete problem like motor pricing in a country or figuring out how to value a book of business by just looking at insurance data and just building a model on that data and coming up with an answer. Well, that's not good enough in this space. I showed you the example of the Canadian lumber prices and the interaction with a disaster in Kentucky. We have to consider the interconnectedness inherent in complex systems. And we have to understand things like the economic and legal landscape, the you know, state of natural resources and so many more things than just being able to take a data set and run it through our models and produce an answer. And you have to ask questions like, how might the system react to the actions of a government? What if a carbon tax was put in? What if we closed all the coal-fired power plants in a country? What's that going to do to employment patterns of our customers, et cetera? Which countries are dependent on the actions of others? You know, this mineral issue is going to create some interesting dependencies around the world on countries and minerals. Are systems fragile and subject to black swans? And this requires us to act in multidisciplinary teams, how to do scenario analysis and monitor those scenarios as we go forward. And I think the last thing I'd say that we need to do is understand what our clients and stakeholders need. You know, they need education and guidance. They, they need to deal with the blizzard of information or tsunami of information that's coming in on climate risk and have people like us interpret that and tell them how to turn that into actionable intelligence. You know, what's important? Obviously, we need physical risk assessment. You need to understand if the assets you insure are subject to, to, to rising sea levels or typhoons. You need to understand transition risk of growing and declining industries. You need to embed all this into the risk management framework. You need to report it to external stakeholders. You need to measure emissions and come up with new metrics around things like scope three emissions and how we're going to help companies meet their commitments towards net zero. And that's all going to require strategies for product design, pricing, reinsurance, and so much more. So there's huge opportunities for climate, for actuaries and climate risk. So many people are driving action that even if uh, you, know, you have countries like the United States and China not act, there's so, much, uh, you know, there's so much momentum due to technology, et cetera, for change, it's going to happen. And our traditional actuarial training does not prepare us well for this stuff. So learning's gotta be ongoing and a career long effort. But our professional organizations like the Singapore Actuarial Society are responding with standards, training, seminars like this to help us get up to speed. And that means that we are well positioned to weather the storm. Thank you.